Hey guys, I'm Lisa Stover with LifeSite News. I'm driving down Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California, where we are reporting on churches who are standing strong against Governor Newsom's orders and are refusing to back down, and they are keeping their doors open. And I hope that you were able to see our interview yesterday with Pastor Rob McCoy at Godspeed Calvary Chapel, where he has refused to um, bow out to these unconstitutional orders. And his interview was so inspiring. I hope you were able to watch it yesterday. If not, we'll post the link in the comments for all of you. But today we are heading from Malibu, California over to Pasadena to interview another pastor who's facing a similar situation, situation Pastor Che Ahn at Harvest Rock Fellowship. And they're a huge church reaching thousands of people every weekend with the message of hope and truth. And they're just preaching the word. And it's just really been encouraging to see all of these Christians standing strong. I mean, when you think of California, typically you think, wow, how liberal it is and, and how just unchristian it must be. But what really, has surprised me is in in California and in these places where it's hardest to be a Christian that's where you find some of the strongest Christians out there and that's what we found this weekend and so we're really excited to share this story and uh, it's really just been a, a blessing to be able to be the person reporting on this story because I you know I grew up in this area and um, you know, I went to camps, Christian camps here in the summer times, and uh, it was just amazing to be able to have that Christian foundation. But this is where my faith uh, was formed, is this area. And I really felt that growing up, you know, you just, you're surrounded by these Christians who you really, you can't be lukewarm because it is a hard culture that they're in. And so you have to make a decision, am I all in with my faith or am I not? So these pastors are taking this as an opportunity to bring glory to God and bring more people to Christ uh, through their story and through their courage as opposed to just backing down and bowing out. So I hope you'll all watch the story and tune in and I'm just really excited for my interview with Pastor Che today. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy it. Well, Pastor Che, thanks for being with us today. And uh, if you could just catch our readers and viewers up on what's going on with your church right now in your community and just uh, across California right now, how has your church played a part in all this? Well, you know, we want to serve, we want to love our community, but what happened was is with uh, Governor Newsom, he locked us down and then he opened it up the service, but for a hundred or less. And our building holds 1250. And, um, and for us just to mitigate and sanitize the whole place for a hundred, we felt like that was not the right thing to do. But because we want to obey the Bible, where it says, do not forsake the assembling of the saints and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we decided, okay, let's keep it 100 or less and we'll open up and mo most of our people will still be online. And by the way, we're very concerned about the elderly, those with underlying conditions, those who are high risk, and we would tell them stay home even though we're opening. But then, Governor Newsom said you can't sing, no singing or chanting. It's the first time an elected official is now dictating to the church how to worship because as you know, the state is not to establish religion or interfere with the free exercise thereof. And now he's telling us how to worship, which is totally a violation of our constitution. So the government is supposed to support we the people, our rights to worship, to free speech, uh, to assemble. But just the opposite was happening, and as a result of that, and then they seeing the dichotomy of him encouraging the protesters, the rioters, to exercise their First Amendment rights, and just saying, God bless you, your voice needs to be heard. And these are quotes from Governor Newsom. We felt like this is really a double standard. Mm -hmm. He's giving them encouragement, but he's locking down the church because right after he said no singing, uh, middle of May, uh, Ju uh, July, I should say, he locked down again. So he locked down twice. And so as a result of that, uh, I was talking to my attorney, what should we do? Should we just go ahead and meet? Because I just feel he's violating our constitutional right. But we felt for the purpose of helping the, the church, the body of Christ at large, that we were going to sue the governor. So we sued him 
And um, so where it's at right now, we lost the first court case here in California. And we knew we were going to do it because it's a very liberal judge, Obama appointee. And uh, he told my, my attorney said that this judge has had a, um, a record of not siding with the church, siding with the state. But we're now appealing to go to the Ninth Circuit. And Lisa, we're going to continue to appeal if we lose until we get to the Supreme Court because we feel that we need a set of precedents for the right as church to exercise our First Amendment rights. And so this is just, to me, I didn't break the law. I believe the governor violated our constitutional rights and we're fighting for that, not just for ourselves, but for the church at large. And to be honest with you, even the civil rights of businesses in our community, because arbitrarily he just shut us down when there's no reason for it. I mean, we've had over 10,000 die out of 40 million, which is tragic, any death is bad. But to lock down the whole state of California, which is the largest economy among the states, is number one in the United States. When you're talking about the chance of you dying of COVID is 0.0002%, not even 1%. And the truth is the majority of the people, I wouldn't say majority, I would say almost 50%, have been elderly, those who are 78 years old, and with those with underlying condition. So that's why in our church, we're encouraging people to stay home if they have any kind of underlying condition. And then we're also, you know, gathering together. And I don't feel we're gathering illegally, we're gathering based on our constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. so, so there's this double standard on the other side where Planned Parenthood is remaining open as an essential service. What what fruit have you seen through your congregation? What what programs or things have come about because of this? How has God blessed your efforts of continuing to to be a light in all of this? Yeah, that's a really good question. Two things have come out. First of all, you know you're you make an excellent point. The church has been essential for two thousand years. Where would our society be if it wasn't for the word of God and what Christians have done to spread? the good news and advance his kingdom. But of course, in California, uh, abortion clinics are essential, uh, marijuana dispensaries are essential, liquor stores are essential. And so we initially wrote to our governor a letter just saying we are essential and please allow us to worship and he just denied that. The second thing is, is that out of this, we felt such a compassion for people in our church that have lost their businesses, lost their jobs. So we started a, what's called City Care Project. We've raised almost 100,000 that we just give away to various businesses in Los Angeles. Wow. Most of them are not even Christians, but just to say, we love you, we wanna bless you. But the thing that really hit my heart, especially after George Floyd, and again, that murder, uh, people uh, were, justifiably upset. But the truth is, is that, you know, 365 babies are being aborted every single day in California. California's the number one abortion state, 133,000 a year. And so as the governor is saying, we got to mitigate so that we don't lose lives. And again, 10,000 plus is, is sad but he's killing 133,000 a year. And so we started a new ministry called One Race for Life. And the reason why we have the word race is because it's a play on words. Number one, uh, we're bringing the different ethnic groups together because as a church, we feel the church can set the example that there's no racism in the body of Christ. Our church is a multi-ethnic church. We have over 48 different nations represented and we have African-American pastors. We have people of every color and here I am, a Korean American leading a predominantly white congregation. But the second thing, the race, is that there's a sense of urgency because every 20 seconds a baby's being boarded in this nation and we really have to work towards overturning Roe v. Wade, the landmark court case that took place in 73 that legalized abortion. And I feel we're so close. We have the Supreme Court judges. Uh, and I know with John Roberts, he vacillates between conservative decisions and liberal decisions, but I think he's pro-life. And I think if a major case came before the courts, we could shift it and bring it back to the state level. And if that happens, then on a state level, we have our work cut out because we have to elect on a local uh, basis, assembly, state senators, uh, local, um, even city council 
uh, people that are pro-life. And so it's one race for life. We're encouraging everyone to vote, to register, but vote biblically and vote for people who are pro-life. And so that's what One Race for Life is all about. So that came out of this whole COVID-19. That's amazing. And would you say that, you know, now that you're meeting, what have, what have your numbers been like on a typical Sunday morning? How many people typically attend this church? And have you seen the numbers increase? since? No, we have. We have because our online viewership is around 3,000. Uh, but uh, the, we're not so much concerned about the physical people showing up because we still want to practice social distancing. So we're encouraging most of our people to watch online. But uh, one of the indicators of us um, knowing that we're growing is our finances has increased significantly wow. during this COVID-19. And so people are tithing, people are bringing their offerings, they're standing with us, even in the lawsuit. And we're grateful for Matt Staver and legal counsel, they're underwriting the whole legal expense, but there are other expense. You know, we had to get a PR firm and we have to pay for some of my travels uh, concerning this uh, lawsuit and other expenses that we've incurred. That's not coming out of um, uh, legal counsel, Liberty Counsel, I should say, Liberty Counsel with Matt Staver, but it's coming out of our own pocket. But God has been meeting all of our needs, so we know we are doing God's will. Yeah, have you found the community has been supportive or other churches in the area well, been supportive of you? Well, the open? church, yes. Uh, I lead a network of churches of uh, around 162 churches just in California alone. Yeah. And so they're all standing with us and they're part of the plaintiff to sue Governor Newsom. So it's not just Harvest Rock Church, but it's the 162 churches that is part of what's called Harvest International Ministry. And so, but we've had complaints from our neighbors and um, what's really interesting, we had the police show up uh, uh, this past week and, uh, and they said, listen, we don't want, the police were so candid, they said, we don't even want to come here. We don't want to give you a citation, uh, but we've got a number of complaints, so we have to let them know we actually did come. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying, but then he said something interesting is that he said they're complaining that people are coming without wearing masks and they're lying to us because we've been standing here and watching all the parishioners come to the service, they're all wearing masks. And, you know, I just know that they are exaggerating um, to make us look bad. So he was siding with us. And so we, we've gotten complaints like that. And people are saying, you know, how could you be so selfish? You could put your people at risk. And again, we tell them, number one, we've been meeting now since May, not one COVID case in our church. But number two, you know, as a pastor, I'm not just concerned about someone's physical well-being, but I'm concerned about their eternal well-being. And so we want to win souls. We want to see people come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Uh, so they will receive the gift of eternal life. And so that is much more of a value for us than just our physical well-being, because we're, we all will die. You know, it's the most democratic thing in this universe. And so, but of course, we want to make sure that we're being wise, we're mitigating, we're wearing masks, we sanitize, we take everyone's temperature before they come in. So we are going beyond what, you know, Costco would do or other stores that are essential. Uh, they don't take our temperature, but we're doing that. And so uh, we are providing a safe environment. So that's been one of the criticisms, but they don't know, you know, what right. we're doing. So, so to other pastors and, and uh, church leaders out there who are afraid to open their doors or who, you know, are, are closing their doors out of, you know, obedience to authority, what right. would you tell them? What would you encourage them with? Well, I think one of the most misinterpreted passages is Romans 13, that we are to submit to authority if they are there to do what's right. But if they're not doing what's right, bottom line, we have to obey God rather than man because ultimately Jesus is our Lord and not Caesar. Uh, and so that's one thing is, is that, you know, there, there comes a time, I believe, that we have to exercise um, our, uh, our First Amendment rights in this country. And uh, because I feel I haven't broken the law, but the governor has. Number two, the Bible says God's not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and sound mind. That's in 2 Timothy 1, 7. That word fear is a very interesting Greek word because it's not the normal word, which is phobia, which we get the word fear from phobia, the Greek word. It's the Greek word dialia, which means cowardice, that he's not caused us to be cowards, 
but He's given us love, because what can separate us from the love of God? The power of the Holy Spirit and the sound mind that we need to get our minds renewed based on the Bible. And as we do that, we'll be able to stand strong. So I want to encourage the pastors, look, you know, you need to exercise your First Amendment right. We live in the greatest country in the world, and we need to take back what the enemy is trying to steal from us, because he's a thief. You know, John 10, 10, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things he's taken away is our liberty. Mm -hmm. And so that's something our founding fathers, and I'm saying this as a Korean <laughs> immigrant that became a U.S. citizen, if I, as an immigrant, but I think, you know, a lot of times we, appreciate it more because we don't take it for granted because we came to this country with liberty and I value that so much that I'm not going to bow my knees to any kind of compromise with a, a governor who doesn't believe in the Constitution. So I, I'm going to stand and I hope that you guys can stand and open up safely, but do what's right before the Lord. Right, absolutely. Well, if you could just leave off on one final thing, if you could have a message for Governor Newsom, what would you tell him? Uh, I just believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I pray that you come to know Jesus Christ and that your mind will be renewed and you'll be transformed. Like me, I was a liberal, radical, left-wing, protesting against the war in Vietnam in 1972, and then I got saved in 97.3 and total transformation. Wow. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, Pastor Che. And and just for being here with us and I'll be praying for you. Our team's praying for you. And uh, just to our, our viewers out there, please keep Pastor Che and his church and his uh, congregation and staff all in your prayers. And uh, as we just continue to report on these stories of churches who are standing boldly uh, and telling Gavin Newsom that, that, that worship is to God alone and not to the state. So Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Pastor Thank you, Lisa. Che. Thank you. And uh, we, we are excited to just continue to, to share this story and, and see how the lawsuit unfolds. And just uh, we'll be praying for you as well. Appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you.